Good evening. This is Forum Daily for Thursday, April 14th. I'm Nathaniel Duick, filling in for Nima Rajan. Tonight, Canada beefs up its support in the Ukraine war. Defence Minister Anita Nan says up to 150 Canadian Armed Forces members will soon be flying out of CFP Trenton in Ontario, bound for Poland. They'll provide Ukrainian refugees there with general support and spiritual services, as well as limited medical care. The troops will also help Ukrainians leave Poland so they can resettle in other countries, including Canada. Well, meanwhile, a new poll suggests Canadians think the federal government is already spending enough on the military. Last week's federal budget included more than $8 billion in new defense spending. Among the more than 1,500 Canadians polled online last weekend by polling firm Leger, little under half say the government is spending the right amount on the military. Another 34% say they want more money in the defense budget, and 18% say it should spend less. Well, from the military to manufacturing, sales rose 4.2% to $67.7 billion in February as the sales of motor vehicles roared ahead by 25%. Statistics Canada reports manufacturing sales rose for a fifth straight month. Sales of food products increased 5.3% to $11.6 billion. In a separate report, the agency says wholesale prices fell 0.4% in February to $78.8 billion. Well, this all comes as Greenpeace Canada says it doesn't think big industrial plants are paying their fair share of the cost of pollution. An annual report shows big plants in provinces covered by the national carbon pricing system paid more than $161 million for their greenhouse gas emissions in 2019. But big industry only pays the carbon price on some of their emissions to prevent major economic impacts. Greenpeace wants the federal government to cut back on how much big industry gets to emit for free. Well, it was a robotic female voice coming out of a defense lawyer's computer that brought Ottawa convoy organizer Pat King's bail review hearing to a halt. Details of the hack were protected by a publication ban, which Justice Graham Mew lifted this morning. At first, it appeared that David Goodman's client files were compromised, but this morning, Mr. Goodman said nothing had been corrupted. Staying in the courtroom, the Nova Scotia Court of Appeals ruling that the province violated the basic rights of people with disabilities by failing to offer them meaningful access to housing care will stand. The Supreme Court of Canada has decided it will not hear the Nova Scotia government's appeal. A day after the provincial court ruled, Premier Tim Houston promised his government would work with the disabilities community. Well, it's another snow day across southern Manitoba. Schools and some highways are closed, and winter storm and blizzard warnings remain in effect. Environment Canada says the storm should start weakening today, although snow and blowing snow will still be an issue, and people are being warned to stay home. Conditions are expected to begin to improve tomorrow, with winds tapering off and the heaviest snow moving into northern Ontario. That's not the case on the west coast. Forecasters in British Columbia are keeping their eyes open for the spring thaw. They'll be watching for quick temperature changes, heavy precipitation, and other factors that can increase the likelihood of flooding. Environment Canada meteorologist Bobby Sakin says the annual flood risk is higher in areas like the BC interior. This is where wildfires scorched land last summer. Chief Arnie Lampro of the Shakin Indian Band along Highway 8 says the community hasn't had a chance to exhale for long enough to even plan for the thaw. This after being forced out by summer fires and November floods. The Atlantic Province's Economic Council has published a report that the calls for the increased efforts to close the digital divide between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities. The report highlights the need for equitable access to high-speed internet in Indigenous communities. It says in 2019, Atlantic Indigenous communities had less high-speed internet access than rural communities, with the exception being in New Brunswick. The report says less than half of Indigenous households in Nova Scotia and PEI had access to modern minimum standards for speed, while no reserves in Newfoundland and Labrador had access to these speeds. While some religious leaders plan to make mask wearing and social distancing part of Easter and Passover celebrations, even though some provinces have dropped the measures. They aren't taking chances, as much of the country appears to be in a sixth wave of COVID-19. Health experts say people who gather for religious services or with family and friends in their homes this weekend should do everything possible to lower their COVID-19 risk. 
In a correction to yesterday's cast, Women's Shelter Canada submitted a report with recommendations for the government's action plan, but did not prepare the action plan itself. We'll have more on the Bank of Canada's new interest rate up next and what it all means for investment. Stay with us. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is crediting his government's new budget for making a hike in interest rates easier to bear. He says measures in the recently tabled budget, such as a tax-free savings account for first-time homebuyers, will help. The Bank of Canada raised its key interest rate by half a percentage point to 1% on Wednesday. That's the highest rate hike in more than 20 years. And Governor Tiff Macklem is warning the rate is going to keep rising from the current 1% level to fight inflation. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister says there isn't any one thing governments can do to help with the rising costs of living, but notes that his government is trying to implement measures that won't make the problems worse. Well, joining us now to give us deeper insight into this interest rate hike is Brendan Caldwell, Director of Caldwell Securities Limited. Sir, welcome to Forum Daily. Nathaniel, great to be here. So, Brendan, Bank of Canada raised the interest rates by 50 basis points on Wednesday. What does this mean for investors? Well, it means a few things. It, it, it doesn't actually mean what I think it ought to mean, or something like that. <laughs> the um, higher interest rates should actually make the market go down. But the market's been anticipating these higher rates for a while, and you're getting a bit of a bifurcated market going in two different directions. So stocks that are trading at very high multiples to their earnings have been under some pressure. The, the so-called FANG stocks or other high-flying tech stocks whose future earnings are being discounted at increasingly higher rates. Um, those stocks have been hurt more. Um, many of those stocks, including a lot of stocks in terms of basic industrials, consumer stocks, stocks where you have a bit more pricing power, um, those, those stocks have actually been responding quite well. Um, so the market's been gone going in two different directions, um, whereas you'd think that a hike in interest rates should be universally bad for stock markets. It hasn't been. Interesting. So how will it affect the, the bond market in particular? Well, that's a different matter. Um, with, uh, you know, the 10-year Canada rate at uh, 2.7 odd up from 1.4, so it's almost doubled since the beginning of the, uh, the start of the year. Uh, it is still hard to justify rates even as low as or as high, I suppose, as 2.7 if you've got if you've got inflation rates at six, seven, eight percent, I think the U.S. inflation rate uh, came out at eight and a half percent, the longest, um, uh, the highest it's been in a very long time. I think forty years. So, it we are very, very short term in our fixed income uh, holdings, holding mostly cash and very short term bonds. Interesting and. Let's, let's move from, from the financial markets to a market that everyone in Canada is talking about, which is the housing market. What does a hike like this mean for Canadians with variable mortgages? Well, well I think at least optically, the Liberals' policy of um, having some sort of home buyer's plan could be helpful, although that already exists in, with the existing RSPs. Um, and as I understand it, you won't be able to use both. So I, I don't know how extra super helpful it really is. Um, I do think, though, that um, higher interest rates are going to make it far more difficult for people to buy houses. Now, it may end up meaning that housing prices take a pause or even come down. When last we saw interest rates move up dramatically, it was the 70s, early 80s, and that put a damper on housing prices. Um, but I guess we did see it again in the... Uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, you saw a spike in rates and housing prices cooled out. Uh, so that may be helpful. When real estate does correct, when the prices do come down, these tend to stay down for several years. So it may provide a window for first time home buyers. Um, I think it's it'll be a while before that settles out though. Well, uh, you know, houses, housing prices may be coming down or going up and inflation looks like it is going up. Uh, and here to stay for a while. What can we do uh, to co combat inflation? Well, I, I think if interest rates are going higher, I think it is incumbent upon people to endeavor to do what they can to get their debts down, or to the extent that they have floating rates on their mortgages, I would strongly recommend they move toward a fixed rate mortgage because I do think rates are going to go higher. 
But uh, inflation, this, these rising interest rates from the Bank of Canada and the U.S. Federal Reserve, in theory, it's supposed to cool out an overheated economy. But I'm not sure this inflation is so much demand-driven because the economy is so darn hot, mm. but rather because of the supply chain constraints due to, well, not just COVID, but the government policies surrounding COVID have made it, uh, have made it more difficult to get goods and services, and the, the, the prices of these have gone up, as will happen. So I'm not sure that raising short-term rates is actually the solution, uh, but I think for individuals, getting their debts down or at least getting the, the rate on those debts fixed, mm -hmm. I think will be key in the next little while. Well, very interesting. Brennan Caldwell, thank you for joining us on Forum Daily today. Thank you, Nathaniel. Welcome back. We will now be hearing from Catherine Murray, host of The Buck Stops Here, to learn how the markets have been reacting this week. All yours, Catherine. Thank you, Nathaniel. Welcome to your weekly market recap. I am Catherine Murray. Well, we are seeing markets mixed today. The TSX is showing some, some modest gains uh, following strength yesterday. The U.S. markets are trending lower today, following strength across the board yesterday, up by about 1%. We are seeing the price of oil up a little bit higher today, on track for 5.4% weekly gains. Uh, we are also seeing the Canadian dollar a little bit lower versus the U.S. dollar, gold slightly lower, and Bitcoin up by about 1% to 2%. As I always mention, the cryptocurrency markets are 24-7, so don't hold me to that number. Uh, away from that, and just taking a look at Canada right now, the TSX, as I mentioned, is mostly higher. We are seeing strength in industrials, communication, energy, as well as financials. The big market story, though, of course, this week is centered on the Bank of Canada raising rates by 50 basis points yesterday, the biggest rate hike in 22 years, trying to tame inflation, which is standing at a 30-year high. Canada's policy rate, therefore, now stands at 1%. It came as the same day that New Zealand's central bank raised rates. And U.S. Fed speak this week is basically telegraphing once again to expect a 50 basis point rate hike in May. The BOC, the Bank of Canada, is forecasting global growth of 3.5% in 2022 and sees the policy rate to return to normal and the normal range being about 2 to 3%, could even go higher if needed. Uh, the governor of the Bank of Canada also pointed out that the unemployment rate is at its lowest in 45 years, so doesn't have a concern about stagflation and does believe that the interest rate is moving higher and will do its job to tame the demand and tame inflation without causing a recession. So that is the big news here in Canada for sure. A few stocks to watch. Baytex Energy was upgraded to an outperform from sector perform over at National Bank, sending that stock up by about 7%. Surge Energy also upgraded over at National Bank. And Kojiko reported better than expected earnings, helping that stock perform today as well. Away from the BOC, um, we also, of course, are taking a look at those U.S. markets and uh, seeing a little bit of a pullback today. Uh, growth is uh, underperforming value stocks. Uh, bank earnings are front and center in the United States, coming in better than expected, but really getting muted investor reaction or trading action following these results. Goldman Sachs, as well as Morgan Stanley, beat on better earnings, uh, better trading, I should say, and also expense control. Citibank came in better than feared, and Wells Fargo stock is under pressure following their most recent results. They have been hit by weaker mortgage banking and higher provisions. Uh, U.S. economic data out this week saw retail sales up by 0.5%, slightly below consensus expectations, but still up 6.9% year over year. Big demand in the United States from the consumer. Also, consumer sentiment rebounded in April. A few sectors and stocks to watch in the United States. Um, Twitter is on everybody's focus point today. Um, received a lot of attention getting an unsolicited takeover offer from Elon Musk. He recently disclosed his 9.2% stake in the company uh, and this week offered to buy the entire company for $54.20. That's a 54% premium over the day before he started purchasing his 9% stake. He also, however, went on to say that this is his best and final offer, and if it's not accepted, he will need to reconsider his current position as a shareholder in the company. 
Away from that, Delta was upgraded over at Barclays, helping that stock. Uh, the analysts there are noting rapid recovery in travel demand, which is more than offsetting the higher fuel costs. Um, we're also actually seeing some of the reopening trades perform very well lately. So think hotels and cruise lines, as well as gaming. We're also seeing steel and aluminum and commodity chemicals perform well in the United States as well. The bullish narrative continues to be inflation has peaked. Uh, the market can withstand rate hikes, that the U.S. Federal Reserve will not cause a recession and or the Bank of Canada for that matter, uh, and that the economic data is coming in strong. Away from that, of course, the bear case continues to be the ongoing uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis, putting pressure on the price of oil and therefore inflation, and that the central banks cannot tame that inflation and it will cause and roll over into a recession and potentially even a global recession. Away from that, as we have a holiday weekend, um, next week is going to be very busy for Canada in terms of economic data coming out. CPI will be the number to watch on April the 20th. Consensus is for 6.1%. Nathaniel, I'll leave it there. Back to you. Well, a full week this week and a full one next week. Thanks for that, Catherine. For more information on the markets, be sure to tune into The Buck Stops here with Catherine Murray. Well, up next, news from around the world, so stay tuned. We'll be right back after the break, right here on Forum Daily. The flagship of Russia's Black Sea Fleet has been badly damaged. This, hours after Ukraine claimed it hit the Moskva with missiles. Russia says the ship was badly damaged by a fire that forced the crew to evacuate, but did not confirm an attack. News of the flagship's damage is overshadowing Russian claims of advances in the southern port city of Mariupol and the surrender of more than 1,000 Ukrainian troops. The warship is named for the Russian capital, and its loss would be a major military and symbolic defeat for Moscow. But meanwhile, the International Monetary Fund says Russia's war against Ukraine is a factor in the economic downgrades for 143 countries. This, while it is calling it high inflation, a clear and present danger to the global economy. The IMF is also warning of the fragmentation of the world economy into geopolitical blocks of countries that sanction or support Russia. It says in a world where a war in Europe creates hunger in Africa, the threat to collective prosperity from a breakdown in global cooperation cannot be overstated. Well, as the war continues to impact inflation around the world, the head of the European Central Bank says it will raise interest rates sometime after ending its pandemic stimulus efforts later this year. The bank faces growing pressure to follow the United States, United Kingdom, and other countries in taking a harder line to combat soaring consumer prices. But it's not so simple in Europe. High inflation is largely imported through higher oil prices, which don't generally respond to central bank moves. A slowing economic recovery is another argument for not raising the rate just yet. Bank President Christine Lagarde said Thursday that the bank is sticking to sequence. The bank has indicated that any rate increase could only come after pandemic stimulus ends. Well, a key ally of Russia says it will reject any pressure or coercion over its relationship with the country. China's comments are in response to a call from U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. It was for Beijing to use what she called its special relationship to persuade Moscow to end the war in Ukraine. A foreign ministry spokesman said China has, quote, made considerable efforts to de-escalate the situation, defuse the crisis, and rebuild peace. China has refused to condemn the invasion of Ukraine by its strategic partner, or even refer to the conflict as a war. Well, this all comes as a delegation of six U.S. lawmakers has arrived in Taiwan on a visit that has already been denounced by China. The U.S. lawmakers are to meet with Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen and the island's defense minister. Taiwan says the visit demonstrates the U.S. commitment to Taiwan. But China's foreign affairs ministry says the U.S. should halt official contacts with Taiwan, which is a self-ruled island, but is claimed by China as part of its territory. Tragedy in South Africa. Heavy rains and flooding have killed over 340 people in eastern KwaZulu-Natal province. This, while well, more rainstorms are forecast in the coming days. Officials said Thursday that the death toll is expected to rise as scores of people, including whole families, are missing. The persistent rains have wreaked havoc in the province, destroying homes, collapsing buildings, and washing away major roads. Well, scientists are sounding the alarm in the Caribbean 
They say sea urchins are dying across the region at a pace that could rival a mass die-off that last occurred in 1983. That's alarming many who warn the trend could further decimate already frail coral reefs in the region. A growing number of reports about dying sea urchins are coming from islands including Antigua, St. Lucia, Dominica, Jamaica, St. Vincent, Sabah, and the U.S. Virgin Islands, as well as Cosmo in Mexico. Well, Elon Musk must have Twitter, at least according to him. The Tesla CEO has offered to buy Twitter outright. Mr. Musk wants to buy the shares of Twitter he doesn't own for $54.20. It is an offer worth more than $43 billion U.S. Twitter said it has received the offer and will evaluate it to decide whether it is in the best interests of shareholders to accept or to continue to operate as a publicly traded company. And two countries in southeastern Asia are ringing in their new year. After a two-year break, thousands of people in Bangladesh and Nepal have celebrated their respective New Years with colorful processions and musical soirees. This comes as the coronavirus pandemic eased and life swung back to normal. In Bangladesh's capital, Dhaka, people clad in the traditional red attire ushered in the Bengali year 1429. They marched, sang, and danced at a prominent arts college on the Dhaka University campus and in historic Ramna Park. The celebration was subdued as the Muslim-majority Bangladesh was also observing the fasting month of Ramadan amid scorching heat. Meanwhile, people in Nepal celebrated the year 2079 with visits to Hindu temples and Buddhist shrines. Well, I'm Nathaniel Duick, filling in for Neemarajan, and that'll do it for today. Thanks for joining us.